This video is for Angela May Banbury as part of her stories from Hell's Kitchen Oral History Research. Welcome to my tour of Hell's Kitchen. For 50 years, this neighborhood was one of New York's most gruesome and crime-ridden slums. The district from 30th Street to 59th, from just east of 9th Avenue, west to the Hudson River, still evokes images of cattle pens and slaughterhouses, gang fights along 10th Avenue, killers with colorful names like Happy Jack Mulraney, Goo Goo Knox, Stumpy Malarkey, and One Lung Curran. Today we'll explore the northeast part of the area. Two themes primarily on the tour today, ethnicity and change. We're standing in front of the International Grocery, and this has foods of different ethnicities, but primarily wonderful things Greek. Here you can get spinach pie, baklava, fresh feta cheese. There used to be more Greek groceries here, but at least we have this one left. In 1850, one in every four New Yorkers, and there were 800,000 New Yorkers at the time, uh, had just come from Ireland. One in every eight New Yorkers had just come from Germany, because so much of New York City's history has to do with what was happening elsewhere in the world to make people want to come here. So this is what we'll be emphasizing. We have a few very interesting sites to show you. And Welcome to my tour of Hell's Kitchen. We're now in front of an imposing neo-Gothic building that went up in 1902. Originally, it was called St. Raphael's Roman Catholic Church, but its Italian community began leaving the neighborhood. Meanwhile, uptown, the Croatian fathers needed more space, and in 1974, they took over this church. And one of the things I love about the name today, Church of St. Cyril and Methodius and St. Raphael, is that the Croatians didn't eliminate the Italian saint name, they just added to it. So I think this is also a clue to the neighborhood of groups changing when they met, incorporating other ideas and not trying to make other groups disappear. So it's change, it's ethnicity, all part of the theme. Here on West 43rd Street, we see the West Side Theater. The building, however, began in 1890 as the German Baptist Church. It was a time when a lot of Germans lived in this area, mostly working on manufacturing pianos and parts for pianos. It was a church until 1968 when the first non-sectarian use came about. A disco and then various theater companies moved in. Today, instead of the church, the building houses two stages and sometimes two different plays can be presented. Uh, some wonderful plays, some of them have gone on to great acclaim. And uh, there's a lot in common, I guess, between churches and theaters. And I will leave it to you to figure out what those connections are. Here on 42nd Street, we are in front of Holy Cross Church. This today is the oldest building remaining on 42nd Street. It was built in 1870. The style is considered Byzantine. It's of simple brick and a limestone facade. Uh, there's an octagonal drum over it, a dome, a lantern, a crucifix, and the interior has fine stained glass windows and marble work. Nine stained glass windows in the chancel, and I hope you get a chance to see them because they are quite beautiful. 
the great Louis Comfort Tiffany designed the mosaics below the dome and in the sanctuary, also well worth a look. The personage most connected to this church, Father Duffy. He uh, died in 1932, and he was the priest here before that. There is a wonderful statue of him in Times Square, part of Times Square, in fact, is named Duffy Square, and in it, he is wearing his World War I uniform because during that war, he was the chaplain of the major Irish unit known as the Fighting 69th. This was a New York regiment with a long and storied history. It was created as a state militia in 1851, but during American Civil War, which starts in 1861, it served in 20 three campaigns and had a reputation for bravery and ferocity. There was a 1940 movie called The Fighting 69th. The American actor Pat O'Brien played Father Duffy. There is one residence, huge residence, in an entire square block of Hell's Kitchen. It goes from 42nd to 43rd Street, from 9th to 10th Avenue called Manhattan Plaza. What was here in the 1960s was the old pinball center. Bally, a major American company, began right here. Now, in the mid-70s, the city planned housing for the middle class, and they built these two 45-story red brick towers with 1,688 apartments and balconies to spur the redevelopment of the neighborhood, but it didn't work. They wanted middle-class people to move in, but those people who could afford the rents didn't want to move so close to a blighted area. Times Square in those days was filled with pornographic uh, movie houses and prostitution, and it was a little scary to come here for a lot of people. So they decided what to do about it. The city took over the mortgage and the federal government subsidized people. They want, there was a federal program to subsidize housing for poor people, but the neighborhood people didn't want poor people moving in because they thought that would make the neighborhood uh, be worse. One developer had an interesting idea. He thought of a group that didn't make much money as a rule, but would add to the quality of life. And that was people in the theater professions. Times Square, so close by. So this became the home where 70% of the apartments were earmarked for people who acted, who performed, who did camera work, who costumed, who were backstage. And 70% uh, of the tenants were that. So if an actor left town for a year to be on stage and a traveling troupe, when she or he came back, the apartment would be waiting. 15% uh, of the residents were seniors, and 15% were for people who already lived in the neighborhood. And it did indeed make a big change on the neighborhood because theater people tend to like to eat out, like to congregate, like to eat fine food if they can afford it, like to go to other shows and go to interesting grocery stores. And, uh, and that changed the vibration a bit of Hell's Kitchen. So it's a very interesting neighborhood to me also in that on the avenues, you see a lot of people coming to go to the shows, to go to the restaurants, but on the side streets, there's a very community feel because a lot of these people have worked on productions with one another and have lived in the same apartment or housing development for many years. And so there are a lot of conversations on the street, which often is not the case in Manhattan, except for dog walkers. Here on 45th Street is May Matthews Park. It was named for a woman who ran the uh, settlement house around the corner for over 30 years. 
the settlement house, which we'll be talking about in a little bit, was modeled off after the first one in the world. It was in London, Toynbee House, I understand it's still there, whereby people of means and people of education would actually settle among the poor to know not only what the people around them needed, but as their needs changed, they could change what they offered. Uh, there was a notorious act uh, event that happened right here in 1959 in an area that was filled with gangs and uh, conflict. A member of a Puerto Rican gang, a, a teenage member of a Puerto Rican gang, uh, came with a colleague, another gang member, to fight a different gang. But when he got to this park, uh, who he found were some local kids who had just come home from seeing a movie. And the man who had arrived wearing a very colorful cape, he came to be known as the Cape Man, took a pointed umbrella from the other gang member and stabbed uh, some of the people, two of the kids that were here. It was especially scary. It was in the paper for quite a long time because the killer said he didn't care and he was only age 16 and he was a member of a gang. He was uh, convicted of and got a death sentence at age 16, but eventually the, uh, the sentence was commuted to life. The neighborhood wanted to make everything safer after this and one way to make a neighborhood safer is to honor people who uh, come together and make the neighborhood better. So they created May Matthews Park that had that on the wall have the names of people who for decades have used the park, have rides and activities for little kids, have grounds for basketball players, and it all brings people together. It's very popular for the neighborhood. It's 200 feet long, one block long. And uh, it's quite a great addition. And it shows you how the change can happen for the better. People coming together, people thinking of ways to honor people in the neighborhood and have them talk to one, each other, one another and to support one another. So there are a lot of different ways this change can come about. It can come for the good or for the bad. Uh, this is an area that had a lot of gangs at the docks, for example. But this is a very positive effect. And I see that there's a lot of new equipment in the park. Uh, and they've gotten rid of some of the old equipment. So it shows that people are still very engaged with May Matthews Park. Here on West 46th Street, we're standing in front of Hartley House. This is a settlement house, a movement that began with Toynbee Hall in London in 1884. In 1897, Marcellus Hartley began this Hartley House when there was a saloon on every corner. Alcohol was epidemic, violence was part of the urban reality, both inside and outside people's apartments. But they could come here where Hartley House made a difference. They started groups, people found support, they found compassion. In the 1920s, May Matthews became the head of this institution. She's the woman after whom the nearby park is named. Today, they still offer very helpful services daycare, English as a second language, sports, senior services, a very good preschool. And recently they've just taken over four townhouses a block away, which will become the homes for LGBT seniors. Now Marcellus Hartley was the grandson of Marcellus Hartley Dodge. He was the head of Remington Arms in New Jersey. Remington Arms was one of the major gun manufacturers in the United States, but Marcellus Hartley chose not to follow his grandfather's footsteps, not to make guns, but 
to help support the neighborhood. So this is all part of the change. I've been discussing things that really help the people come together and improve their lives. One of my favorite spots in Hell's Kitchen is Poseidon Greek Bakery. It has been family owned since 1923. It began a few blocks from here on 40th Street, West 40th Street, but the owner was told he had six weeks to leave because the city was going to build the Port Authority bus terminal on his site. He decided he did not ever want to be in that position again, so he purchased this building and by having a company own the building in such a way means that there's a much better chance they'll be able to stay on. Uh, it's now in the fourth generation. Andy Fable and his wife Lillian Fable currently run the bakery and very fresh items are made in the back. Uh, they have fabulous spinach pie and baklava. They're very proud. It's a real social center of the neighborhood as well. And don't come on a Sunday or Monday, though, because those are the day they're closed. Hell's Kitchen to buy the wonderful, fresh, hot out of the oven delicacies of Poseidon Bakery. In the 1980s, this one block of West 48th Street was considered one of the 10 most dangerous streets in the city of New York. Drug wholesalers presented their wares to drug retailers. Prostitutes walked up and down the street. The police wouldn't help, and it was a mess. But in those years, the city started a very interesting program called the Green Thumb Program. The city had amassed over 11,000 abandoned vacant lots when people couldn't pay their mortgages and the city took back the houses. And they very smartly thought that if they rented the lots for a very nominal sum of $1 or $5 a year to the neighborhood, that would make the place nicer until the city was ready to actually sell the lot. So uh, the program began over 750 community gardens. Well, when the neighborhood put down their money for the rent, they came to investigate. What did they find here? Buried pets, three rusted cars, and one had bullet holes and a dead junkie. They complained to the city. The city took the body, but they said, the problem of the three rusted cars up to you. But this was a very smart block of people and they knew just what to do. They just pulled the three rusted cars into the middle of 48th Street, play, uh, claimed they knew nothing about how that happened, and the city was forced to remove the cars. So for years, the neighborhood worked very hard. They created over 100 vegetable plots, and um, it was quite a huge labor of love to plant flowers, plant vegetables, have bees for honey. And then one terrible day, the city said, well, you're at the top of our list and we are now going to sell your garden for a, for a development. Well, the neighborhood brilliantly came up with another idea. They put a small ad in the New York Times and said, have you ever wanted to own part of New York City? For $10, we will sell you one square inch of our lot. That's how they raised enough money, uh, $86,000 of money, to be able to purchase the lot, and now it is a permanent place. And this really proves, I think, the theme that we've been talking about. It's multi-ethnic. The neighborhood is. People get together. They share their pasts and their presence and realize that they can have a wonderful neighborhood if they work together, figure out what needs to be done, uh, whether it's planting vegetables or building a gazebo 
or honoring people of note in the past. Uh, so it is a wonderful addition to the neighborhood. Uh, it's called Clinton because that is a developer's alternative name for the neighborhood. But a lot of people prefer the term Hell's Kitchen. It's historical, it's romantic, and it's a great place to live.